Okay. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction and thank you for asking me to speak today. It's really great to, to come along and join such an esteemed panel. Um, I, <laughs> I was panicking about being near the top of the programme here and then after Sarah's very good point about got it out the way, eating the frog can then relax and listen to everybody else's presentation. So yeah, I'm, I'm liking that approach. <laughs> so um, yeah, I am a research and test engineer at Depew. Um, I have been here for, it will be 20 years next year, which is kind of scary. It's gone very, very quickly. Um, for those people who aren't familiar with Depew, we are um, a division of Johnson & Johnson um, and we are the medtech side. So we make orthopedic implants. In Leeds here, we focus particularly on hip replacements and knee replacements and um, the surgical implants that, uh, sorry, the surgical instrumentation that's used to implant those. In the laboratories, um, we are doing preclinical testing of our new prototypes, whether that's implants, instruments or anything else that might come along with the whole kit um, before they're sent to clinical trials. Um, we, our products are nine times out of ten new innovative designs. There are no standards for testing most of what we'd come up with, what have our development team come up with. So huge part of our role is going back to first principles, looking at the conditions in which these devices are going to be used and then designing the tests and then using those tests to evaluate our products for regulatory submissions and so on. So as a staff engineer, um, my role is massively varied. I do a huge range of different things, um, not just the testing. Um, I'm a manager for four, a team of four. So it takes up about 50% of my role looking after them. I have a senior engineer, two grad engineers and a technician. So I spend a lot of time working with them on their development and coaching and training and so on. Um, then, of course, is the bread and butter, the research and publications. So designing those tests um, and where we can. It's difficult to publish a lot of what we do as opposed to work in academia because some of our work is on proprietary new prototypes. Um, we're not allowed to talk about them until they're out in the market. So it kind of limits what we can publish. Um, but where we can, we really like to get stuff out there, get out to conferences and so on. Um, Big part of my role is um, involved with Six Sigma statistics, whether that's um, improving how we do testing, um, working on improving processes, lean engineering, design excellence, that kind of thing. Um, a big chunk of what I do is also looking on process and systems development, and that could mean a whole range of different things, whether we're looking at buying new kit for the laboratories, changing how we do a particular kind of test, introducing new software. We are very much going towards the tech side of medical devices, so um, smart devices, intelligent kit, um, and a lot of software development is now coming into that, which is a whole new skill set for a lot of us who are mechanical engineers traditionally. We're very, very heavily regulated in the medical device industry, and rightly so. These devices are going into people, so we need to get it right. Um, so ensuring that our tests are properly validated, everything is as it should be. Quality is the top thing that we focus on all, every single day and safety for the patient. Um, and that feeds into regulatory submissions, preparing data for the regulatory bodies like the FDA or BSI to inspect when we want to release a new product. That all forms part of the test engineer's role. And then at the other end of the market, we are looking at complaints that come back to us as well. So unfortunately, things do go wrong in, in implants in, in real life. And they come back to us for analysis to try and figure out what's gone wrong. Um, and that's a really fascinating part of the job, um, diving down into, you know, looking at fracture surfaces and microstructures and so on to try and figure out why a hip broke or why an instrument wasn't working in the way it should. And then we can feed that information back into new designs going forwards. We do a lot of external collaboration. I work with a lot of different universities, whether we are mentoring um, undergraduate or graduate projects, uh, doing lectures. Um, and then we also work a lot with the standards bodies as well, with BSI, ASTM, ISO. A lot of the big companies do, as well as I know the universities do. And we are working um, collaboratively to develop 
better standards for testing medical devices. Um, so as the technology improves, we need to introduce new standards to um, develop um, to to ensure that we are testing. Everybody's testing those new products to a, a benchmark, as it were. So we all work together to to ensure that we're aiming for a common goal there. Um, and when I do have time outside of all of that, I try and do a lot of STEM work. I mentor some students, A-level and uh, younger students as well. Um, I love going into schools and doing lectures and fun games, that kind of thing. I've also done lots of work at various museums, um, just activities with kids. And it's great seeing how young kids get so inspired. And a lot of them, you know, don't even realize what engineering is, especially the really young ones. And when you explain to them that, you know, you're an inventor, you're like a scientist and just seeing their eyes open up and it all clicking, it's, it's brilliant. I love doing that. Um, and then I do some volunteer work for the IMECI as well. So along with Pete, who's here, and I believe Yoan is also here, um, we do some work for local biomedical medtech type work in the Leeds area, trying to organise events and, and things. So uh, that's part of my role. So, yeah, very broad, varied role. And I completely forgot to mention that's my gang at the top there. That's my partner and our three little girls. Um, so coming to work's the easy bit of my life. This is my rest and break. Um, yeah. <laughs> so how did I get here? Um, my slides won't. Oh, there we go. There's my slides. So, um, yeah, I've probably not had the most uh, straightforward route to get where I am today. Um, went to school in Kent. Um, school probably wasn't the most supportive of an engineering career. And with hindsight, I think that wasn't any kind of bias. I think they just genuinely didn't really know much about it. We didn't have exposure to any engineers or people who had that kind of experience. Um, so stumbling on an engineering degree was very much an accident. I knew I liked biology and mechanics and maths and stuff. Um, and it really was a case of flicking through the prospectus and Bradford popped out because they had a really funky drawing of a hip replacement in their prospectus and it popped out and went, that looks really interesting. Let's go and do that. So I applied and got in and um, yeah, finished the work at Bradford. Um, and this is where kind of education and career kind of started to overlap. So one of the key things that really appealed to me about Bradford was that they did, um, they offered sandwich degrees, which at the time wasn't that common. I think more people are doing it now. Um, and so I had the opportunity to go spend the third year of my degree working for Escalap in Germany, um, which is a very similar kind of med tech company. They make implants and surgical instruments and that kind of thing. Um, and working for them in the laboratories there really kind of opened my eyes to how amazing all of this different stuff was that we could do. So when I came back to Bradford and graduated, um, applied for a job at Depew and luckily was lucky enough to win a contract role there. Um, and I put in some of my early jobs in there as well, um, a very early dabble in um, fast food retail outlets made me realise that hospitality was definitely not my career choice. So, um, yeah, I'm glad I stuck with the uh, the engineering and didn't go back to McDonald's. Um, so I was at Depew Synthes. I started as a contractor for the first few years, then after a couple of years became a permanent member of staff. And at that point, um, I went to my manager and said, I'd really like to get chartered, um, but I need a master's degree to do it. Would the company consider sponsoring me? Um, and she said, no. And I was like, oh, oh, OK. She said, no, because we want you to go and do a PhD instead, which was great. So off I went to Leeds and I did my PhD part time over seven years um, whilst working at Depew. Um, that was hard work. That's that was a challenge. It was kind of every evening, every weekend for a long period of time. However, with hindsight, for me, it was exactly what I wanted to do. I didn't want to go back to university and be a student. I was really enjoying what I was doing at Depew um, and that kind of it fitted in really well. And there was a really nice mesh. It was really um, it was a really strong link between what I was doing for my PhD and what I was doing for Depew. Um, and then I finished my Depew, uh, finished my PhD and then did eventually get chartered. Um, and then that's kind of led into the, the role where I am today. Um, and yeah, it's. Like I say, I've been here for 20 years, but it's a really, um, I've never felt 
the need to to move anywhere else. I'm really enjoying what I'm what I'm doing and where I'm working. We've got a, a really supportive environment and company culture. Um, and it's been a really inspiring place. There, there's always a push to kind of go and try something else, go and do something new. Um, and it's a place where there's been lots of opportunities to learn different things and, and different skills and, and so on. Um, I'm very lucky that in the whole time I've been working here, I've only ever had, I shouldn't say lucky, but I'm very, um, it's just serendipity that I've only ever had female managers the whole time I've been here. Um, and they've been incredibly inspirational to me. Um, always been very, very supportive, very understanding of the challenges of combining family and career and so on. Um, but that's kind of worked out very well. And, and the company as a whole, um, I think like Sarah was saying, biotech tends to attract a far more women than other areas of engineering. And here I take it's about 50-50. Um, and we have a lot of very experienced, incredibly intelligent and good at their jobs women um, here in the company. So it feels like we have a lot of mentors here on tap um, who are always very willing and supportive to go and speak to um, at any point. Um, and that's kind of been a real driver throughout the years I've been here to kind of follow their example and so on. Um, I've probably run out of time, haven't I? I've been talking quite a lot. <laughs> There is loads more I could say, but perhaps I'll save it for the questions. I've never done an abstract where I needed to reference and format. Excellent. Thank you very much, Megan. I will also take the, the opportunity to some, to some of you if you will allow me. So Megan is an experienced staff test engineer. Her focus is on preclinical testing. And what's interesting also is her interest in test strategy. And um, it's good to hear uh, a, a, another person who's done a part time PhD um, at, at the University of Leeds and then gone on to become a chartered engineer. Uh, I found it really interesting in terms of your skills development and expertise focused on research and development and specifically lean engineering and this idea for continuous improvement of processes of design to increase efficiency but with the focus on uh, manufacturing and um, to increase competitiveness within the market it was also really interesting to hear about your your passion for public engagement uh, and i thank you for that again thank you very much thank you so our next speaker is Dr Jenny Smith um, and this is a, a slight step away from sort of the the engineering really in terms of how we might classically think of engineering so Jenny is a European patent attorney um, so I'll hand over to Jenny. Hi yes so um, I suppose I've stepped away from kind of the university and research um, life directly but I still interact with it day to day um, so I my background is that I did microbiology at the University of Leeds and then through that I um, did my final year project in um, the effect of wear particles um, and on um, on hip replacements and so that's how I got involved in the IMBE at Leeds University, the Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering. Um, so then from that I was offered a PhD through their CDT programme. Um, uh, so I, with that programme you do a master's in um, whatever you didn't do. So if you were a biologist you do a master's in engineering and if you're an engineer you do a master's in biology. So I did a master's in engineering um, part time with my PhD and I took on a project with Richard Hall, who's here, and Joanne Tipper, who um, has left now. Um, and my project was looking at spinal cord injury and trying to create a model of injury in um, collagen gels. So it was very much a combination of biology and engineering because I had to look at the mechanical properties of the gels and the um, the rig that we used to impact the gels um, but obviously all of the kind of analysis of the um, the reactions was all cell cell based so it was a complete merger of my two disciplines with neurology thrown in so it was definitely quite um quite a challenge um and yeah, so I really, really loved it. But I did also feel that 
research wasn't for me so I found it very very hard um, and often quite demoralizing when things didn't work um, which was often for me um, <laughs> and yeah I just wanted to kind of still use my knowledge but not necessarily in um, research and I went to a talk um, that the Career Centre at Leeds Uni put on called How to Get Out of Academia um, and there was a really lovely lady talking um, from who was a patent attorney from a firm in Manchester called Newbin Ellis um, and I'm still in touch with her now um, she did a really good talk and I just thought wow that's definitely for me um, it was kind of do you want to still um, still be involved with research every day do you love writing do you love arguing do you really like having a massive to-do list and being really structured and organized in your day um, and I was like yeah that's that's for me so um, I applied to a few firms went to some open days um, and I actually got contacted through LinkedIn because my the firm that I went to work for was very strongly linked with Johnson & Johnson and in particular Depew and obviously the IM, IMBE which is where I did my PhD um, was very linked with Depew so and lots of people went to work there um, after their PhDs so it was kind of really useful for me actually because they wanted me because I was so linked to them and I obviously know a lot of the inventors there um, so yeah it was it that was really really useful for me um, and that's basically how I got the job um, so I got taken on as an engineer so in when you are a trainee well in in the field of patent um patents you work in your specialist area so i would never touch a patent application that was to do with software engineering or anything like that you um you have a very specific area although mine is actually i do some biology and a lot of medical devices um because i've got the microbiology background as well um but what's been really useful for me is that all of the exams to do to become a patent attorney are mechanical engineering based um, because they can't expect an engineer to understand like how a uh, antibody works but uh, anyone can kind of look at a simple mechanical device and perform the the right things for the exam on it so all of them are um, mechanical based so that was really useful for me um, and yeah I, I basically do pretty much 90 percent medical device work so um working from um drafting applications right through to prosecuting them which takes a number of years often about four years um work in europe and um that's why i'm qualified in europe but i'm still doing my exams to be qualified in the uk um, but I also work with attorneys all over the world, so in Australia and China, Japan, America, just everywhere. Um, so yeah, you get to speak to lots of different people. Um, I just got back from America, so I got to go to um, a big, a huge conference in San Diego last week called BIO, um, which has about 10,000 attendees. Um, so I saw lots of posters um, which brought back memories um, and we were the kind of there as I suppose parasites of the convention where we were there to meet all the other um, Jenny you've just muted I didn't touch anything that's perfect thank you how much did you miss You'd just said about being the parasites of the conference. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we just went there to meet all of the, um, basically loads of different patent firms go to this conference and we get to talk to each other and try and get each other to send each other work and also um, meet, like often a, um, a PhD researcher isn't who we need to speak to because you won't be able to make decisions on where to send your um patent filings but uh, it's kind of a really good environment to meet lots of people and do lots of networking basically so yes yeah, so I got to spend a week in San Diego doing that um, 
and it's yeah I can't it's a really interesting job you get to meet lots of people and work with lots of interesting inventions and it's much more positive for me than research because mostly everything you work with works already <laughs> so you're just explaining how it works and why it's amazing to people so it's yeah it's good it's very positive um and there's not a lot of women actually in um in the field of intellectual property there's much more in trademarks so most firms are you can get legal firms that are kind of you're part of this huge legal firm that will do corporate law and everything but mostly with patents because we're not um we don't do our full legal exams we could we can only do our patent exams so um most firms are kind of intellectual property practices um so you get a mixture of patent attorneys and trademark attorneys and there's a lot more trademark attorneys that are women um which normally kind of boosts the numbers around the office but if you actually look at patent attorneys the numbers are very very low um and i think that's because basically the numbers are low in stem anyway um and then by the time you then add on most most patent attorneys have a phd as well so you get the the knock-on effect of there's probably less women doing um science phds and then even less then want to go on and do four to five plus years of exams to qualify as a patent attorney um so i am six years in seven years in october and still only european qualified not part qualified so in terms of like family life and stuff like that it's very challenging doing exams at the same time i know a lot of people that have just kind of um not decided not to take exams one year because they've got babies and um i think yeah it does it does make it a challenge um and can make it take longer and i think that can probably put women off um but it is a job that it doesn't really prevent not being qualified doesn't prevent you doing things necessarily um so it's it's a balance really but there are considerably less women um in in patents really and then um we do we have our own groups so we've got um women in ip um and there's lots of activities so i've organized talks in leeds to get women into to ip which uh, quite a few people from leeds have attended in the past we've not had them for a few years obviously um but it is it's a really exciting career and um yeah it would be great to have more ladies in it Excellent. Thank you, Jenny. Much appreciated. Um, can I just sum up again um, the, the talk? Um, so Jenny has an extensive experience in prosecuting patent applications, which seems like for a variety of um, um, activities and also products, services and systems, which includes mechanical devices. As well as, as well as medical devices, and that's everything from drafting through to the, the prosecution of applications as well. It was interesting to, to hear your, your integration and combination of, of, of different disciplines, which includes biology and engineering and the expertise that run across that. So from life sciences to health tech to biotech and, and medical devices. The other thing that I found quite interesting was that your development of a diverse and international portfolio. Um, and when it comes to becoming a, 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 a European patent attorney, the, 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 the lifespan of what that might look like in terms of continuous development. But it seems that in order to actually succeed in, in that area, um, you have to hold an interest in science, technology, engineering, maths, and specifically STEM. So this may well be an opportunity to diversify your portfolio for people moving forward in terms of different careers. So that's nice to see. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'll just stop spotlighting you. Um, so our next uh, speaker is Sarah Crossland. Uh, she is currently a PhD student in her final year of PhD at the University of Leeds. So I shall hand over to Sarah. Thanks for reminding me it's the final year, Claire. No, no pressure, no pressure. Um, following up on what Megan said, engineers must have to work in subway at some point in their lives to get there, because I've done a stint there too um, and decided it wasn't for me forever. Um, 
I think because I'm so early on in my engineering uh, journey, I'll start with my background and work up to how I've fallen into engineering and what that kind of has led me on as a female engineer. So I come from a completely non-engineering background. None of my family, are, they're all kind of non-skilled workers, which I hate the term because And they don't, they didn't go to university. We've got no engineers in the family, no STEM in the family. And I thought initially engineering is cars, it's planes, it's boys with their toys. I didn't really have a grasp of it, even when I was in college. So when I came to deciding what to do with my A-levels, so I did maths, further maths, chemistry and physics, you know, the pretty standard kind of engineer toolkit, but I didn't really know what to do with it. I knew I wanted to apply my skills in some way. So to me, um, I really enjoyed physics. So I thought, right, I'll go be a physicist. I'll do a physics degree. I can apply my math. I can apply things. And don't get me wrong, I really enjoyed it. But there seemed to be lots of options in physics and no real overlap between them. Kind of you were in astro, you were in lasers. Everybody kind of had their own little niche. And I just knew I didn't quite, it wasn't quite for me. Um, so I specialized down a little bit more and I enjoyed working with people, but was never going to be a medic. Um, and so I kind of combined the two and started and did a degree in prosthetics and orthotics. So I qualified as a clinician to be able to make prosthetic limbs um, spinal braces, leg supports, all range of things, which kind of was able to use my materials science from my physics degree and started going on to kind of in a little bit more of a biosphere. But research was something that really, really um, drew me. I wanted to do more. I wanted to improve these things. You see them and you know that they're, they're not really um, at the pinnacle of where they could be. Um, so improving patient outcomes and medical devices was something that really spurred me on. So I looked around and I thought, well, what can I do? Where do I go now? Uh, and a PhD at Leeds uh, popped up and it said, oh, we do tribology, but we do um, medical prosthesis implants and I thought well inside the body outside the body it's it's the same difference really I'll, I'll go speak to them so I was invited to come and talk and I thought yeah this is for me like they'll give me the opportunity and they said yeah we like that you've come from a different background we like what you've got to, to bring to it and I thought oh yeah engineering this is great this is the combination so it actually it was narrowing down to be able to get to engineering in the end. Um, maybe I should have been there in the first place. I've kind of gone around the houses to become an engineer. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm very new to it. But yeah, I really like how engineering combines the skills that I already have, but it provides a real output to the problems that I want to solve. So I had problems in physics and I thought, oh, I'll go in and I can apply them with people and see a real output. And I can in clinic, but then I still saw problems and I wanted to do more. So engineering was kind of the central point working back for all those things and using the skills that I've got. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm in my final year now in the um, integrated tribology CDT at the University of Leeds, uh, focusing on skin tribology. So I'm looking at diabetic feet in particular and looking at how we can assess when an ulcer might occur on a diabetic foot using low cost strain toolkits that we're developing uh, with the idea that in the future, these could go forward towards clinical translation and have that potential. So, yeah, I really enjoy the fact that engineering has actually brought out more of my practical skills. I like getting involved and I felt like in physics, some of the stuff, even though I was an experimental physicist, um, in terms of what I did in my master's and my undergrad. I feel like I'm much more hands-on in the work I'm doing now. Maybe it's more grassroots, whereas the physics work was building on um, lots of principles that other people have developed, but I can get stuck in for a problem that I've spotted rather than a problem that's been um, diagnosed and decided for me. Uh, on the other side of things, I've been doing a lot of outreach, like Megan said that she was involved in too. So it's a, a big part of what I enjoy doing. So I go into schools quite often. I was in the college this morning uh, doing work from everything from year seven through to year 13 generally. But I especially end up, end up working with groups that are less represented in university backgrounds uh, to try and encourage that university is for everybody if you want it and if it's right for you. Um, and that there are routes into STEM that you probably don't know about. So doing my prosthetics and orthotics and coming into my research and how STEM is involved in that kind of thing. 
And yeah, I really, um, I've also from that been able to work with a smaller groups um, and a charity working on personal statements to help and encourage uh, pupils that are from those backgrounds, how to enhance uh, their personal statements to attract um, universities to, to accept them so they can get their foot in the door. Because once you've got your foot in the door, that's it. it like you were saying, Sarah, it's a really inclusive environment when you, when you get to university generally. And so it's that foot in the door that you need to, to kind of get there. Um, I think I had quite an, a nice route into engineering. I, I built my way up there, so I didn't feel there was many barriers for me. But initially going to university, it felt like a scary place that, you know, you don't go. Um, but yeah, I, I'm really enjoying like the translational skills that I get from engineering and I'm finding my way bit by bit. So listening to all these talks, it's given me a lot of options for when I finally finish up of where I might uh, take it. But from the women's side of things, one thing I did notice is when you go into uh, the Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering, it's full of women. It's a really positive environment as a woman to see those examples and you go, yeah, this is great. Then you move into the Institute of Functional Services, which I'm in, and there's a, a bit, you know, there's fewer women. Then you go to the Institute of Design and Robotics Optimization, which is where my office is, and you go, there's no women here. But even though you see the, that split between the biological and what some might consider kind of um, hard materials, I guess, in, even though it's soft <laughs> often in the in hydro, um, you see that split of females, and I guess it's apparent if you look for it, but I don't feel like I've ever been viewed or excluded as a woman in, in any of those spaces because it is quite an inclusive environment. People see me as an idea person, just like they see each other. And I think that's the thing with engineering. You are all there to tackle a problem. That's what engineers want to do. Other people choose other careers for other reasons, but you kind of find your niche because everybody there has a problem and everyone wants to solve a problem. So you're viewed as a problem solver rather than a woman. Um, but that's probably, like you say, insular to a university environment. But yeah, I think that's kind of all I've got to say because I'm very uh, early on in my journey. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that, that, that conversation and insight into what you do and how you want to progress. Um, just a, a couple of notes I, I, I noted down. Is that, Sarah, that you're actually doing a, a PhD and you're a PhD researcher at the University of Leeds? Um, and what's fascinating is that you're qualified in author, authentic, sorry, authentic. So that that means, and I had to look that up, so you're not just uh, in terms of your your scientific background but you're actually considered a healthcare professional as well and with that focus it brings an interesting insight to the, the area and field of tribe biotribology and um, you hold a, an honorary contract and your focus is on uh, diabetic foot care and what I do find really interesting and also with regards to up and coming opportunities within academia and outside academia is the educational outreach activities that you do. And I know that you're an educational outreach fellow um, for the University of Leeds focusing on specific teaching at secondary education of maths. And we appreciate the fact that you're feeding forward to the next generation as well as considering your own future. So thank you. So we have our final speaker, um, Dr. Alex Smith. Uh, she is based at the Royal Academy of Engineering. And again, I LinkedIn stalked you for your job title, so I'm not sure if that's absolutely up to date. But um, as far as LinkedIn is concerned, you're a senior policy advisor. Um, so I'll hand over to Alex. Thanks, Claire. And that is true for at least the next month until I go on to comment <laughs> into the Cabinet Office uh, to have a a job called Head of Systems Thinking in the Office for Science and Technology Strategy. It's all very, uh, uh, I use silly words there. Anyway, um, I thought it would be helpful if I start by unpacking what on earth my current job means. Firstly, describing the Academy, which I guess maybe some of you know as a funder, but um, firstly, we're a charity uh, set out to deliver public benefit from engineering excellence and technology innovation. Then we're a National Academy, which means we are want to provide progressive leadership for engineering and technology and independent expert advice to government, both in the UK and globally. 
then we're a fellowship, which means we bring together all of the leading business people, entrepreneurs, innovators and academics from every part of engineering and technology. But uh, as a fellowship organization that nominates members, we are currently just 6.4% women and it's just kind of unacceptable really, isn't it? So it's something that we've really set out to change over the next, uh, or over till our 50 year anniversary, which is maybe in five years. Anyway, our overarching goal for 2025 is all about harnessing the power of engineering to build a sustainable society and inclusive economy that works for everyone. Um, and then we do this through talent and diversity, innovation and policy engagement, which is where I belong. Um, a job and policy is kind of all about collecting evidence through interviews with some of those leading engineers, reading literature and holding evidence gathering sessions or design workshops, really trying to facilitate interesting conversations between different people that maybe wouldn't normally uh, meet. Then we try to articulate that evidence for lay audiences in reports, written briefings, speeches um, and sort of respond to any select committee inquiries. And then finally, we have to disseminate that evidence, whether that's presenting at events that we organise ourselves or by others through government teach-ins um, and meetings with policymakers in central government, devolved administrations and local authorities. But how did I get there? Um, if I'm honest, like a lot of people I think have just said, it was a bit of luck. Uh, in school, I loved maths and art. Um, I was used to engineering because my dad had a small manufacturing company, but they made stone crushers, which I really didn't care about. I stumbled upon medical engineering at an open day and it sold me on that sort of human benefit bit. So I then did an engineering degree at Leeds. Um, and if I'm honest, it was really hard and it was really boring. Um, and as we run our shiny, this is engineering advertising, advertising campaign, I often find myself ranting about how this needs to change and needs to, that education bit needs to be much more, um, yeah, needs driven and about people a lot more than it is. But hopefully in the last decade since I've left, um, that's already happening with input from all of you wonderful people. Despite that, um, I still went on into a research role and then a PhD. Um, fast forward a few years and I was getting to the end of my PhD and I am really terrible at thinking about the future, but I knew I was done with re research. Uh, following a career discussion with my supervisor, I latched onto the idea of a job in policy. I definitely didn't know what that meant. And despite almost five years in the role, I still don't really know now, but that's okay because I'm always learning. Uh, to help me work that out, my supervisors offered me a part-time placement in uh, the Leeds Medical Innovation Office as they were carrying out a science and innovation audit of medical technologies in the Leeds city region. And I loved it. Conversations were, um, A, there were conversations, there were people involved, they were at a much higher level than academic research, and you still needed those analytical skills to balance out lots of conflicting views and to try to use data to tell a story. But the collaborative the collaborative nature of the work really inspired me. So I thought, well, we can try this. I drew inspiration from a lot of people at this time, but I have to give special men mention to my supervisor, Claire Brockett, who along with her academic excellence, took the time to actually consider my strengths and where I might fit. Um, and really, she also showed me the importance of kindness and the idea that you can uh, share a bit of yourself with the people that you manage, an approach I have adopted ever since. Um, after a few failed attempts, um, where it was probably quite clear that I really didn't know what I was talking about, um, I finally got a job at the academy as a policy officer. This essentially required a step back, including a pay cut, a move to London, which is cripplingly expensive. Um, but I was pretty much, but I was instantly excited as I got to learn the ropes and was thinking about important topics such as greenhouse gas removal, air quality and data sharing, all through an engineering lens. And here I, I became really excited about engineering probably for the first time. Um, shortly after I joined the Academy, Hayat and Salim took over as CEO and on International Women in Engineering Day, it would be slightly remiss of me not to give a mention of the weight that she has really given to the importance of improving the diversity and inclusion of the engineering profession. And it's really inspiring to me to see such a clear, such a clear goal driven ambition um, that people really rally around. So the organization was starting to grow and be more widely, widely recognized as I was promoted to a policy advisor. This role is basically the same with many of the same activities, but 
this time I had some leadership opportunities and was able to set some of the direction myself. And it became my responsibility to build the government relationships and understand what we could most usefully do. Sometimes this was really hard, starting with a blank page, trying to understand what the engineering profession could most usefully offer, especially whenever there's lots of things going on already and like lots of, I guess, competition for want of a better word. Um, but the project autonomy really allowed me to be a bit more creative in what I did and explored sort of public engagement activities with our policy work to try to get young engineers thinking about the ethical implications of some of these advanced technologies such as artificial intelligence. As all of as I was doing these roles, we were developing a national engineering policy centre, trying to bring together the UK's 43 engineering institutions and representing half a million engineers. Uh, this includes the IMECI. Um, and that was a really fascinating experience in sort of being involved in building something new, doing the learning by doing, testing things and exploring different ways of working. And it was interesting to use some of that engineering ways of working, but applying it to the softer stuff, the relationship building and um, yeah, the communication pieces. Um, turns out all of that stuff was quite straightforward because then in March 2020, coronavirus hit and I ended up embedded in the Academy's positive response program. This is largely because I am so nosy and wanted to be stuck in the middle of everything and was driven by the cause. Um, this involved a complete change of pace, delivering rapid evidence summaries with specific, um, answering specific government questions, uh, trying to involve, um, yeah, and sort of, trying to learn when enough is when it's good enough rather than aiming for things to be perfect or as good as they can be. I've worked a lot of long days, but it was so inspiring to see that sort of engineering community respond to some of those challenges. Um, and I think Professor Kath Noakes uh, from Leeds really deserves a special mention here because her leadership of the government's science advice group for emergencies, also known as SAGE, um, the subgroup that she led and I was part of was just incredible how she corralled so many different voices and spoke with such clarity while also conveying all of the uncertainties was so impressive and um, a skill engineers really progress, I think. But I know she inspired so many policymakers in her attitude and I think really has changed the view of many people of what engineering can offer. Um, after the most intense part of the pandemic ended, uh, I moved into the broad areas of risk and resilience, thinking about what we can learn from this and other emergencies and understanding how government risk assessments might be improved so that we might be better equipped to deal with some of this stuff, whatever the next emergency may be. Um, although there's probably about six going on right now. Um, with these and all my projects, I'm surrounded by some of the most inspiring people in the engineering field, basically on a day to day basis. And sometimes I forget how lucky I am and it kind of takes being asked to speak about who inspires you um, to actually think about that. What really never ceases to amaze me, though, is how generous they are with their time and how they allow me to ask stupid questions without getting impatient or at least not visibly. And so often they go above and beyond what we ask of them. Um, in the last few months, we've been mapping hospital discharge pathways and the lead fellow, Professor John Clarkson at Cambridge, just always takes the time to coach me in that sort of systems leadership piece that we try to champion. Or as I developed our risk policy portfolio, Professor Joan Cordner at Sheffield spent hours just sharing her decades of experience of organisational risk management and really like helping me understand some of those complexities and uh, what I needed to know. I'm going to stop here because I could spend hours listing inspirational people uh, over the last 18 months. I've started to grow my own team and I'm trying to borrow bits from what others have shown me so that my team might be inspired too. And one thing you realise with all of these, these things is it's not easy. It takes time and energy, which are sometimes in pretty limited supply. Um, but it's so important and I think a massive part of being an inclusive leader and what will sort of help diversify um, some of the workforce issues in engineering and beyond. So thanks everyone.
Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, and thank you for that, that, that inspiring talk. Um, Alex, for now, it, it is a senior po policy advisor um, and it seems to be your, the focus on risk and resilience. Um, Alex, I, I, I'm aware, has COVID policy experience, which is well sought after. Um, Alex is described as an enthusiastic and versatile engineer with a PhD in, in medical engineering. I'm actually quite fascinated in the, this, this idea of policy and how that translates problem solving into policy, policy engagement and integration. Um, and I, I'm interested to probably hear a little bit more about the focus on greenhouse gas removals and the effects of technology on future workforces that projects that you've been working on. So thank you very much, Alex. I appreciate your, your conversation. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Claire right now. Thank you. Um, so that concludes our panel of speakers. Um, I've learned lots just listening to you um, and I, I know all of you. So that's it's really interesting sort of to, to sort of appreciate what you do. That I've I've known lots of you for for quite a few years now, and suddenly realizing sort of how how engineering feeds into your role, um, and how it's got you where you are is is really really inspiring. So thank you all. Um, so if we could give our speakers either unmute and give them a round of applause, or through reactions, that would be lovely to thank everyone for speaking. Excellent. So. We are now moving on to um, some questions. So we've actually got quite a few that have already appeared um, in the chat. So I will um, have a little look. Um, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand um, and we can come to you. Or if you want to pop something else in the chat, please do so. Um, so the so. Ari has asked about failure, but I might just start with something a little bit more gentle for the pa panel to talk about. Um, so I guess um, several of you have highlighted um, sort of public engagement and, and, and STEM engagement. So Megan Sharrox asked, how do you all think we can help children become more excited in or involved in STEM, in particular engineering? So I like to open that to all of you I think. I could say a little to that if you'd like. Lovely thank you. I think I've both experienced this and I believe there's a lot of data to support this is that the earlier we get to children the better so we're talking kind of preschool early primary school ages is the time that it's been shown that children learn about what an engineer is um, and not just somebody who fixes the car or the washing machine, but all the range of different jobs that we do. Um, and they, they really do engage at that really early age. I've worked with very young children um, in uh, kind of STEM activities and they are fascinated. And that's the time. To, and the, but up until that point, they often don't even realise what it is or let alone that women can do it as a job. Um, so getting in there really early with primary schools and things and finding more ways that we can show kids what what we do and, and, and what is out there um, is, I, th I think, the key thing. Um, my daughter, I think she came into our lab. It was pre-COVID, so she'd probably been about three or four and she had a look around the lab and she was like, wow, mum, this is so cool what you do. And that's the sort of thing that you see in STEM events and things, but that's the age that they are still that innocence and kind of, yeah, really inspires them and gets it going. So definitely getting in there early is the right, right starting point. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. Um, I think someone else, um, one of the panelists, Sarah, mentioned about um, not seeing it in school because of schools not really knowing much about engineering so even going in at a high school level and just you know presenting what it, what it's all about um for us we we're actually looking to target local schools um it's kind of like the beginning of a levels especially the girls schools and just giving them a you know hey have you thought about this and um, we also present some practical active learning um, exercises that always gets uh, students uh, interested 
to add on to all of that, um, I know there's some other outreach um, women in, in the uh, participants today. I think that's it. It's outreach women that we're seeing now. I know fewer fewer men that are going into schools and that are doing kind of this on the ground stuff. There are a lot of women because we want to do it because the men don't, not that they don't need those role models. The role models are there. We can see them in everyday media that wherever you want to look, you can find a male engineer. But women are kind of, I think we've turned that corner now. We're saying, no, we'll go in schools. We'll show them. And that's, it's the trickle down effect, I guess, from the top as well. You'll see more at the top eventually when they go in, but it's going to take, it's going to take time because there's not as many women filling those top roles to then trickle down to see it. And I think one of the issues is in, in media, women engineers have kind of, to external non-engineering audiences are viewed as like, here's a token woman to talk about it. And I think that's still the case. If people are not in that engineering sphere, they see it as, oh, they've brought a female engineer out. Whereas in engineering, we don't think like that. We're like, oh, that's a really accomplished engineer. We don't talk about their gender or anything about that. It's like, that's a really accomplished person who's got this, this and this, and they've brought in this much money and this and this. And you talk about their accomplishments. Whereas outside, somebody just sees them, oh, they've brought them on the news because they're this. And then you don't see that that kind of, yeah, the trickle down effect because the outside kind of bubble doesn't see female engineers is anything more than a token in my opinion still but by getting out there and it being female led kind of a lot of the outreach that I'm on an anecdotal basis that I'm seeing in schools um that can only be positive surely like you say Megan getting in super early going to high schools going to colleges getting them at each stage of life showing them the different options there are getting them to come into places of work just nothing is a bad thing to do and everything is a positive you don't know what you've never seen before um, and if no one shows you it and no one opens that door, you're never going to know. So women going out there and doing that can only be a positive thing, in my opinion. Hey. Yeah, just uh, just a really quick comment to sort of follow that. Uh, it kind of struck me, actually, from from Megan saying uh, you took your kids into to work and I've done the same. I've got two daughters and I brought them in. So I work in robotics and as Sarah said, it is quite striking, actually. I mean, firstly, they love it. It's really interesting to them. They see all this cool technology and uh, they enjoy that kind of thing and, and getting involved in it. But I think from my perspective, I'm very conscious now that you're like, yeah, you are surrounded by males. And it's really lovely seeing this because you think, well, they do need role models to look up to, to, to say, like, you can go on to do this as much as I can tell them. I think it's more powerful for them to see an example or examples of people who are doing this every day. Um, so, so, yeah, it's, it's really good. I think it's, uh, it's nice seeing these demonstrations and across a variety of subjects as well, because uh, engineering often has that kind of it's just what, you know, the, the perception of it just being kind of very old school. Actually, what we're seeing here is a really diverse spread of different types of engineering, even within say mechanical or electrical engineering, it's, yeah, there's a whole whole range there. I think that's the thing you can say to children, do, do you like problem solving? Yeah, are you creative? Do you like, I did art and textiles at GCC. I use those skills, material science, understanding the weaves of the textiles, how that can cause different um, tribological interference at the skin surface. Even simple things like that, my art, my planning, my project planning from art and knowing how to set things out. I say, well, do you do those? Like, yeah, well, I can't be a scientist because I do maths and I do art. Yeah, but that's creative. You're thinking, it, like you say, Pete, there's so many jobs and careers engineering covers such a broad spectrum that other uh, other smaller kind of industries can't that you can say to someone if you're creative you like problem solving you like a challenge then we can find you a job like there is a job for you in that field you know it's it doesn't limit you the way that some other jobs do but you psychologically everyone who's not in an engineering family or background you just think of cars and airplanes and you don't realize actually there's just an absolute cornucopia of roles that you can tailor to yourself rather than trying to fit in. So I, I think that's that's a really nice set of observations. And I think Pete and I having been on and, and Lisa Deer and having been on um, interview panels will probably recognise that we still have students that come applying for an engineering degree that 
the reason they're applying for an engineering degree is they like maths and physics and want to do something practical, um, which indicates that even now everyone's perspective of engineering isn't necessarily what we're doing. So I think um, the more outreach we can do, and, and as Megan says, the earlier we can embed it so that the kids understand and, and can actually start thinking about that path is, is really important because I'm another one that ended up as an engineer by accident from school. I went and was a cardiac technician for two years and it's just because I got involved with the pacemaker surgery that I thought, oh, right, I want to I want to be on the other side and design stuff. So I ended up doing a medical engineering degree, having left school and actually starting on another career because I didn't know what engineering was um, and certainly didn't know about medical engineering as well. So I think it's 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 really interesting that we're still getting students to going to university w with a less than brilliant understanding of what engineering could involve. Pete, have you got your hand up again or is that a historic hand? Yeah, lurking in the background. <laughs> you there? I am sorry, Claire. That was a, as they say, a legacy hand. I hate okay. that description. Um, I just ran to get the wash in because it's um, it's starting to chuck it down here after oh, all wow. this. At the end of work, it's starting to, to rain. Sorry, I'll be back in a second. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. OK, so I'll just look at some of the other questions. So Jenny, we've got one very specifically for you. How did you find the stress of going straight from a PhD into more exams in your career? Jenny, I don't know if if you heard. Sorry, my internet went off. I think. Oh no! <laughs> so, so there's a specific question for you about how did you find going straight from the stresses of a PhD into more exams in your career? Uh, yeah, yeah. So what I didn't say before was that I hadn't actually finished my PhD when I got this job. So I'd finished the research, but I hadn't written up. So. We've lost Jenny, so um, maybe I'll move on to. Um, it might work if I'm on my phone. Oh, brilliant! Um, <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear yep. me? Yeah. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, you can hear me. Yes. OK, um, so, sorry, no I'm problem. on my phone now. Um, yeah, so I hadn't actually finished my PhD. I had um, done all the um, all the lab work except for some final imaging. And the first day of my job, I had to say goodbye to everyone, pretend I was going home and then run off to the lab and sit in the confocal suite for like five hours taking some final images of some slides so yeah it was quite intense and then every single night I had to go and write up on the way home and at lunchtime on the train um, and then by the time I had to take my first exams which was I handed in in the September and then my first exams were in the October I was actually just quite a sponge for information because um, I'd been working so hard um, and that was really helpful actually. I kind of got through those. I think I had 26 days I think it was and um, passed those um, and then every year since then I've actually found it harder um, to do the exams. I think because work is harder and um, I'm older and more tired. Um, but it is it is a kind of it is a big challenge but I think the PhD really really prepared me it got my writing skills up it got my uh, my reading skills um and just being able to hold a lot of information in your head and kind of compare all the different papers that you've read and construct um some some arguments and some um of your 
your background uh, yeah it was really helpful so it is very daunting and the exams are really hard but I think going straight from PhD to the um the job helps because you've not had that break to get into normal life and realize that you can actually have weekends and evenings free so <laughs> I hope that answers the question and sorry for my internet no problem. There is a follow up bit to that in terms of could you recommend top suggestions for someone considering applying for a patent job in order to stand out in their application? Oh, I think we might have lost. I don't know if you said something to me then, but I can't hear. Oh, can you hear us now? OK, so I'll, I'll pass on to the, the next question, which was what would you say about dealing with failure? So I think we have heard lots of your success in terms of career progression and, and achievements, but what about when things haven't worked out quite so well? How have you dealt with um, things going wrong and, and moving on. I'll let you all think about that for a little minute because I think that's probably one to <laughs> not have an immediate answer. I think it's mostly about taking the time to learn the lessons about why the things went wrong, what was in your control, what wasn't in your control. Um, I'm not going to share any specific examples, but trying to do that wash up afterwards. Why wasn't that as good as it could have been? Um, and bringing in the different people involved so that together you work out what you all could have done and how it can go better next time. Um, I find the main way I move on after these things is by checking myself really deeply into something new and distraction but it's really important to pause work out why and uh, move on after it in my opinion yeah i think the analogy of the, the cheese moving is 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 exactly that so it's just yeah stepping back and saying well there is there could be another way I think you could say that I've failed everything I've ever done in some ways because I've moved on to the next thing. Like I've not, it's like I've given up. I've given up on physics. I've given up on peanut. I've moved on. I've moved on. So you could say like, it's not failure. It's learning. Like everyone always says, you've got to look to fail to be able to learn something new. And so I feel like it's inherently a part of engineering because you are trying to problem solve you wouldn't get the end result if you didn't fail. So I don't see it as failure. It's just kind of something, of course, it was going to happen. Otherwise, I wouldn't ever get the end result. Uh, it, it should happen. It sh I should expect it um, rather than being shocked when it happens. It's like, well, this has happened now. OK, well, what do I do now to solve it? It's just another problem to solve. <laughs> Even if it's not an engineering problem, it's a mental problem to solve for yourself. But yeah, I see it as everything is a constant fail till you get to the end point and even then you can develop it further so yeah it, it builds you and it makes you you better that's a really good point because um with yeah the way we teach engineering as well it's it's not a linear there's always feedback loops going on um there's a messy bit in the middle where you're just trying to figure things out and those are all mini failures aren't they until you kind of figure things out and come out the other end so yeah, you're right. It's, it's really part of engineering. Oh, engineering. That's part of our job to, to fail and to keep it. Yeah. Anyone got any other comments on that? Yeah, interestingly, there was this new thing a few years ago where uh, academ some academics, and I think they were the more successful ones, started to publish um, failed CVs, so all the things they failed at. <laughs> so I wonder if anyone's done that before. Oh, Richard's got his hand up. <laughs> Richard? You're muted. Good. 
even after two and a half years, I can't click the right button yet. Uh, I just want to thank all the speakers you know, on behalf of the Power Trip Consortium for giving some, you know, for giving some great insights into uh, engineering and the, you know, and the female perspective of kind of uh, uh, engineering. It reminds me of uh, Natalia Batalia, who tells a story that when uh, before she became the head of uh, the Kepler mission for NASA. She didn't know what she was going to do. She liked a bit of economics. She liked a bit of uh, maths. She thought she'd do something on the border between economics and maths. And then when she got to college, she had to do a discovery module, a free module. And she kind of went to do some physics and found that she thoroughly enjoyed it. But I think the kind of story here and the story that I see from all the speakers is how kind of people kind of almost come into engineering by accident. You know, this idea that, you know, men, you know, my colleagues by myself, you know, I knew from an early age I would always do research, you know, th you know, that's what I wanted to do, that that's what I've been exposed to. I'm not quite sure how, because my dad was an engineer, he, 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 he enjoyed cars, but I actually loathed cars, you know, I could, you know, I could just about fill up the, with petrol of my partner, she deals with the oil change and taking it to the garage and things like that. So, so I hated cars, but, you know, I always knew that it was interesting. I wanted to solve things. I wanted to fix things. But um, And a lot of, you know, I speak to a lot of my male colleagues and they have the same idea. They knew from an early age what they wanted to do. And I wonder what we have to do to get that instilled in females, you know, from an early age to do that, you know, to build that engine. Is it just about, you know, exposing kids in schools or, f or young females in schools to do that? Or is there is there something else that needs to be done? I suppose that's my question to the panel, really. Is it is it just about exposing young women or young children to engineering, or is there something else? Is there something else about facilitating you no know, opportunity to do this? I think as much as you can expose someone to everything, you can give everyone the opportunity to show them. If the general consensus, like you see all those um, media stories where they say, oh, I went into Primark and I saw the women's top and it said, I love sugar and candy canes. And the boys top said, let's go building. And it's that bias kind of in life that I, I mean, even my own mum, she'll say to you when we were younger, it'd be like, right, come on, let's get things tidied up. And the boys would still be running around, but she wouldn't mean to do it. It'd just be, okay, I'm going to be going and be the helpful one. I'm going to be, so those stereotypes that kind of unconsciously exist, you know, do get passed down. And I think even if you're being told you can build, you can fix, like I always helped my dad with the DIY. My brother was rubbish. I'm the DIY. I have my own toolkit. He didn't. I, I'm that person. I was always a problem solver, a fixer, a doer. But you do get fed this line by the world of, oh, but you you like straightening your hair and wearing makeup. Yes, but the two can exist in different worlds. And I think that's the problem. I think sometimes the outside engineering is getting to be that inclusive environment, but people just don't know it, so don't come in. Um, I don't think once you're in the door, there's as many barriers as there are from the outside world. But that's what I would say. It's You can expose everyone to everything, but... Yes, yeah, societal pressures still exist. Okay, thank you. There's also a lot of lazy attitudes, right? Like there was the big storm a month ago or whatever when the diversity champion at a select committee inquiry about women in STEM said physics is something that girls don't tend to fancy. And, you know, we're, we should be past all of that now and we're not. So, um, yeah. I think there's every there's a lot of change that needs to happen for um, it all to. Yeah. yeah, I think obviously there's a moral obligation, an ethical obligation to you know to have an inclusive community, but also I think there's a practical obligation because I don't think you can count on men to design the world for everybody. I think you can only count on men to design the world for men because that's their perspective. It's not that they don't actively go out to design it to be anti-female, well, perhaps some do, I don't know, but, you know, they don't go out to, to do it, but they do have a, a perspective which is sharply male. So when one talks about transport, for them, transport is getting in and out of work, whereas we know that females are more care, you know, have bigger caring responsibilities, so they have, 
lateral transport issues, they want to get to family or to caring or other caring responsibilities. So I think, you know, it's not only a moral obligation, I think there's a practical obligation to bring women into engineering so that they can give their own perspective of what, of what the priorities are for them and their, you know, and their colleagues, as it were. Although if uh, male engineers are just dismissing their responsibility to design for all of society, we've got a really big problem, haven't we? So, uh, yeah, I don't think that can be the cop out. There are plenty of ways where you can consult a very diverse range of people to make sure that your innovations are as inclusive as possible. Yes, making sure that they are as good for everyone is a challenge, but I don't think or I strongly disagree with um, not at least attempting to overcome your individual biases. Yeah, oh yeah, you know, I completely and agree with that, but the only way to make it happen and to ensure you're making it happen is by bringing women into engineering. You know, you'll always get a half-hearted, I think you'll always get a half-hearted attempt because the presumption is, as uh, I think it was Simone de Bora said, you know, women see their view as a neutral view of the world, which in fact it's only developed around the male perspective. It's not a neutral view of the world, but they see it as a neutral view of the world. I think it's not enough just to bring women into uh, engineering either. They also have to want to stay, which well, is, a uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think my medical engineering cohort uh, was 10 people, nine of which were women, and I don't think any of us have stayed in actual engineering everyone's moved into either marketing or sales or in my case policy like uh, and there has to be a like a systemic problem there right yeah yeah i'm not you know i'm not you know i'm not just you know i'm not disagreeing with that at all we you know we you know that that systemic problem is you know has been well, well articulated uh but i think you know without without women engineers with there's always going to be that essential bias it's even down to things like uh, clearing snow from roads. You know, again, often snow plows in Sweden were, until very recently, designed, the plans were designed by men, which ensured they could get to work. And then they found out that women were falling over, fracturing their hips because of their care duties or whatever, and therefore they you know, realigned the snow plows and they found that they reduced the overall cost to society. I suspect that's probably the societal bias again though so not necessarily I think in, in Alex's point that actually that's perhaps just because the engineers are addressing a societal bias rather than I'm not necessarily sure that having a, a woman engineer contribute to that would have made things different but it, it's reflected in medicine as well that you look at things like um, everyone knows the symptoms of heart attack except women don't have the symptoms of a heart attack but we all know it's more likely to be neck pain and back pain and so women tend to get the hospital later with a heart attack because we're all briefed on, on a man's kind of symptoms so. and i think to touch on what um alex you said about kind of why aren't women retained why aren't they staying you see that there was a study years ago about how you hire um, people that you see yourself in so if you're hiring people from your own pool then the workspace becomes a mirror of you and exactly. it becomes very insular and then people who feel like they don't fit in that workspace unless you're actively got the capacity of, of mental strength to go against it and for some reason think that you can fight it and change it which it, why should you have to you know there's obviously lots to unpick with that as well but yeah, if you have a, a mirrored environment where you just keep hiring copies of yourself, then you, it's never going to change, is it? Even if you show women that they can do it. Um, and like you say, if everyone's moving into marketing and sales, why, why is that? Lisa Dion, can I bring you in? Yes, thank you for, for giving me the opportunity. And it's fascinating to hear the, the different stories and different perspectives and insight. I'm, I'm just going to pick up. So I, I, I'm, I'm reading from the, the comments and also um, picking up on what M Megan, you spoke about um, female female managers who were inspirational to you. And that kind of leans into two comments about motivation and inspiration from um, Bethany and Megan. But I want to just expand on that a little bit by asking you, um, 
um, it, it might be easier to, to think of who, who inspires you, but can I ask all of you, how do you inspire others? Um, so I, I find with my students, um, you share a bit of yourself. I think uh, was, there was one of the speakers was, that mentioned that that you you do share a bit of yourself with your students. So um, I maybe that's part of the, the the process of being empathetic. But yeah, I, I do tell them, oh God, I, I hated that part of my student year, and and just um, getting them to to realise that the challenges and the obstacles that you get through. I think some students see their um, their uh, lecturers as probably not relatable. So um, sometimes some of them do look up to you, some of them not so much, but the ones that do look up to you, um, yeah, I, you, I, I just encourage them when, when we have those kind of conversations and, and just tell them, well, this is what we've, I've done or this is what I know someone else has done. and. And I think that that inspires them. But but you know, students are so um, uh, they they have such they're very passionate. So that they've already they're already um, inspired, you know. But uh, sometimes they just need a bit of a direction. So sometimes that that guidance of do it this way or make sure you're doing this or talk to this person. Um, so I don't know if that inspires them, but um, th but being relatable, I find students connect better. Sorry, can I ask? Sorry, can I ask the the the, the other Sarah the, the same question, please? Um, yeah. So, touching on kind of Beth's comment about having positive experiences with women in engineering. Obviously, Claire is my supervisor, and she is my first foray into engineering world. And having Claire as a supervisor is probably the reason, one of the biggest reasons that I can get through my PhD, because. As all of you know, those are your doctors on the panel. Um, it's tough. Uh, it's mentally tough. And having someone like Claire, who's like she says, she's not come from that traditional route. I don't think I've come from a traditional route. But then again, what is a traditional route these days? But it's it, someone that you can see yourself in. And Claire will say, yeah, I have bad days. I have good days. And she's so honest with with you about that. And to have somebody who's honest um about that experience that I can relate to as a woman I go oh it's not just me then I'm not just thinking that because everybody has those thoughts of imposter syndrome but to hear from your mentor that they're having them too you go but you're amazing you should be thinking this like do you're the reason I'm I'm trying to copy you I'm trying to be you and then when they're saying it and you go oh we're all just living this and it really that's that's one of the things that inspires me it's not necessarily in the work side I know it sounds stupid but it's the work obviously her work is inspirational that helps but the personality behind it is a, is a big thing um so yeah that kind of touched on to Megan's comment of what motivates me is is wanting to be like the mentors I see like to if I could be half as successful as Claire and have that relationship she has with her students she wants everyone to grow and develop no matter who you are where you've come from or what you're doing um, you were talking earlier, I think it was, was it you, Alex, who was saying how Claire gets to know you and what your skill set is to try and help you find a role and where you fit in. And that kind of motivates me to want to become someone like that who can help people equally love engineering and feel that it's a place for them to be in. Um, and that's, what, but as a mentor myself, Lisa Dion, I feel like I've not given enough yet I'm so still early on in my journey going into the schools hopefully I give them an experience of what engineering could be or the skills that they see that I had that they that I apply um but not necessarily anything as an engineer yet for myself excellent thank you uh, uh, many accolades to Claire on that can I ask um Alex then followed by Megan and then Jenny if that's okay this to respond to the same question yeah I mean I Totally agree with uh, what both Sarahs have said, really. Um, I think it's a lot about listening and listening to what the individual wants or needs and then responding to try to motivate and inspire um, as a result of that. I'm lucky to work in a really interesting area. So there is quite a lot going on that 
can inspire um, and sort of trying to frame things in that bigger picture what is it what change is it actually making what are you contributing to um i think it's always a good way to inspire um people i'd agree with all of that as well and slightly on the flip side that it's really really valuable to share those kind of challenging experiences in day-to-day -day work with your mentees or people you're coaching but one thing i found really helps is sharing when I feel really passionate about something like we're working on something and it's like wow look at it have you seen this this is so interesting and it might be the geekiest thing ever which it usually is with me but <laughs> I love it and you know, these the, look at these patterns in this data this is amazing and kind of sharing that helps kind of I hope that that demonstrates the passion for what I do and then helps to inspire, you know, finding that kind of thing in, in, in other people's work as well. And the other thing I found that really helps building up relationships with people I'm, I'm, I'm working with as well is kind of getting, yeah, kind of all, uh, I've forgotten the phrase, kind of just mucking in and all getting on with it together. Um, not, not being distanced like some leaders can be. Um, but just kind of all hands on deck and let's all muck in and get this job done. And then that really builds up a team mentality, I think, and really helps. Thank you. OK, um, I hope you can all hear me now. I can hear you again on my fourth login attempt. Um, yeah, so I suppose I've just always tried to be a mentor and like agree to go um, do any of these talks I'm asked to do I'll always do it if I'm free um, and throughout my PhD we did lots of outreach we used to go to Skipton girls school I don't know if you still do that and I absolutely loved that um, and it was really amazing because they had definitely were a lot more um, had a lot more opportunities and were a lot more um, kind of had, had just just a lot more experience of engineering and um, and science than I had when I was growing up at school um, and we also went to our own schools as part of that because I was a STEM ambassador um, that was actually really awful because my old school was exactly as I remembered it and was not very motivating at all and actually said they had their own business like a hairdresser instead of me so that kind of summed up my school um, but I still went and um, tried to try to inspire them to do science but um, yeah I think there's definitely definitely battles and um, it, there's, I suppose you've just got to do as much as you can and doing doing talks like this and especially to, to younger children um, really in schools that's really important um and then in my job arranging the women in ip events but obviously then you're kind of targeting people that have already gone um through education so you're you've got a limited pool there excellent thank you amazing responses to the, to the question now thank you i appreciate that and um, can i hand back to claire now if that's okay absolutely so do we have any other questions Is there any, anyone in the audience that wants to pop something in the chat or or ask? Lisa. Just just one question. I know it sounds a little bit cliche, but it, it'd be interesting to get a response. So where do you see yourself in 10 years from now? As I say, I really don't think about the future. Um, so who knows, whatever the five more things I trip over and find interesting and inspire some curiosity in me and yeah, are surrounded by interesting people is, um, I definitely don't have an answer to that question. It could be anywhere. It's a question I find really hard to answer as well. And this is one of the challenges I found all through my career is I've been really lucky to land on my feet in a job that is brilliant. It's really good. Yet 
all the time I see colleagues from university and so on moving every couple of years to different jobs and finding out different roles and I found it very hard to um, plan my career path and, and, and think you know is it the right thing to keep chopping and changing building up loads of different experience in different areas keep push 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 or is it okay to be happy in a job really enjoy that and stick with it um, and the two paths needn't necessarily be completely divergent, but certainly for me, that's something I found really challenging to kind of figure out where I want to go. Um, right now, this works for me, but yeah, I have no idea where 10 years will take me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I always feel very lucky that I chose this career because I didn't really know anything about it much before I came into it and it is one of those careers that you're kind of stuck in for life I suppose um yeah there's just like you're just on a career trajectory to try and get partner or director um if that's what you want to do um unless you change completely um and I, yeah I think for me I'm really happy in my role and I'd like to carry on progressing in 10 years I'd also like to have a family and for that to have not stopped my career progression which I hope is something that is definitely possible um and yeah I think that's like my 10-year plan I suppose have another whip it as well because I love dogs excellent Oh, thank you for sharing the, 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 that, those future plans with me. I appreciate it. I'm definitely well, going to hand back to you. Sorry, I was going to say sorry. that um, having a dog is my retirement plan. Because <laughs> I think uh, that's what I need to do. <laughs> yeah. He is a lot of work, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not as much as a child, but. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. If I, I may just add a little bit on top of what Megan was saying with regards to, to sort of staying rather than like chopping and changing between places, I think in academia it's it's kind of a drive that you should move somewhere else. And I think that's changing now, but certainly a couple of times I felt that I should have, have moved. Um, <clears throat> and so I've been at Leeds for 18 years. And I've I've stayed here really because the the research base is excellent. The teaching base is excellent. Um, and I've had no need to change, but some of you on, on the panel will know that I'm, I'm about to move, so I will be changing location and job later on in the year to, to move to Sheffield. Um, and that's hard going to to have been rooted somewhere for 18 years to make a choice to move is is th th there's been a lot of weighing up about that but I think it's important to sort of share my experience of that as well because there will be people that will find their home and and live in that home for a while whilst they're developing their career but actually Megan may decide in two years time that actually there's somewhere else to go and and actually as much as sh should you go somewhere else or, or should you stay is is a difficult question to answer I think also you I, I certainly found that I've got a bit of an er inertia now that I've taken root in Leeds and so making a choice to stay or go sort of mid-career because I'm that bit older because Megan gave it away with telling everyone that she'd been at Depew for 20 years so yeah I have that old but it, it's it's possible to sort of make those cha changes at any stage of your career and I think that's really important for women to realise because I think we tend to go on a path and and that's the path we're going to take and and I mean I quite happily flipped career um two years in um to do a degree and then I was absolutely convinced after my degree I was going to design um, heart valves because that's what I'd done before and I sort of did a Depew placement so I've got the Depew influence as well and, and, and have, have changed my stars as it were but um, I think it's yeah I think it's just interesting to recognise that paths aren't set so the 10 years for all of you is probably going to throw up some weird things for Alex it definitely is um, I think she's perhaps the 
more open to it and and sort of aware that that's what's going to happen than maybe all of the rest of us because of how she's sort of run her path so far um but i, ju I just wanted to to chip in and I, I appreciate i'm a chair and i shouldn't be chipping in but i just like to um sarah i think you were going to say something yeah i was going to say that's a really good point about academia because you do end up setting roots there especially with your research um i, I consciously thought about that too and and um I realize if I'm going to stay that I need to grow in a different role. So looking at something to take on and not get too bored. Um, and that does happen if you're teaching something for too long. 